Chapter 3 is going to be looking at the cell, the way it's organized, and some of the major processes that occur in the cell, including uh, DNA replication and cell division at the end of this. So we're going to start by looking at the overall structure of the cell and move on down through there. Just very brief historical perspective, Robert Hooke in 1665 was the first one who saw a cell. He was looking at cork and noticed, oh, there's this nice little arrangement here. And then about 10 years later, Antoine von Leeuwenhoek uh, also did quite a bit of looking at cells. He's considered the father of microbiology, so I have a little bit of bias towards him as a microbiologist. Uh, he used a simple lens and made a simple uh, single lens microscope and was able to observe larger fungal cells, etc., often looking at rainwater and things like that. But noticed there were these, as Antoine von Leeuwenhoek called them, these little wee beasties or these little animalcules, these small organized structures that were not visible with the naked eye. And obviously since then we've done quite a bit of extensive studying of them. The cell theory just states that all living things are composed of cells and all cells come from other cells, which might make sense to us, but keep in mind that if the first cell was seen in 1665, since then there's been quite a bit of change in technology and the way we think about things. So um, there's a point in time where they weren't really sure where, where the cells came from. The cell membrane <coughs> Excuse me. All cells have a cell membrane, whether it's an animal cell, plant cell, bacterial cell, fungal cell. They will all have a cell membrane. The membrane for the cell membrane is also in some older books you may see it as a plasma membrane. It's the same thing. It's going to control what moves not only in the cell but also what moves out of the cell. So it's keeping that internal environment of the cell separate from the external environment, so it's a form of protection and regulates, as I said, what moves in and out. Some of the functions will be determined by the type of proteins that are in that cell membrane or on the surface of the cell membrane. The cell membrane is described frequently as a fluid mosaic model, meaning it's not like cement. It, there, there's some movement, like side-to-side -side movement within the cell membrane. It's also semi-permeable, which means it's not a free-for-all. It is going to regulate some items can pass through and some cannot. It is a phospholipid bilayer. Remember, phospholipids are a type of lipid. They're a fat. Uh, bilayer, meaning it has two layers of this. Embedded in the phospholipid bilayers are some proteins. Some of these proteins may extend the entire width of the membrane. Some of them don't. Some of them just can be more on the surface, either extending on the exterior surface or extending on the interior surface. So the most common way to describe it is that it's a phospholipid bilayer with embedded proteins. And once again, as we just said on the previous slide, what proteins are there, that will kind of determine some of the specialized functions. So the proteins will be different from one cell membrane to another. Cholesterol is also found in that phospholipid bilayer. It helps to stabilize the membrane. In that phospholipid bilayer, in the middle of the membrane, it is hydrophobic because it's lipid. And then on the surfaces, both on the interior surface and the outer exterior surface, it is hydrophilic. Remember, hydrophobic, it does not want to be with water. Hydrophilic, it will easily mix with water. So in this diagram of the cell membrane, we have right here, the hydrophobic portion of those phospholipids. This is what we call the, the head. And so it's two layers. So one layer and two layers. <coughs> this area here in the middle is the portion that is hydrophobic. The edges, the surfaces are hydrophilic. 
Now with the proteins that are embedded in this membrane, there's several different types. There are some that we call them integral proteins, there's channel proteins, receptor proteins, glycoproteins, peripheral proteins. All of these will have a specific type of functions or jobs for them. If we look over here, some of these uh, integral proteins tend to uh, span the entire width of the membrane. Uh, this would be considered an in integral, but it's also a channel protein. Uh, it, it's going to help transport things from one side to the other. It's, think of like if you stuck a straw and you're able to have your drink move through the middle here. It's a way of letting uh, hydrophilic substances pass through because this area is hydrophobic. You have some that proteins, as I said, that may just be extending uh, on the interior surface, some on the exterior surface. Some of these are going to be special receptors, so other chemicals can come and bind. They recognize this. It's like a docking station. Some of these uh, extensions, a gly glycoprotein just means it's a carbohydrate or a sugar that's attached to a protein. Glycolipid is when you have um, a carbohydrate attached to a lipid substance. And so some of these are markers that will distinguish, say, your cells as an animal cell, but some of them distinguish it as a human cell more specifically, and some of them are unique to you. So your markers would be different than my markers. And also, I just want to point out here real quick, this ring structure down here, you see one here, one over here, and one over here. That is the cholesterol that's helping to stabilize, stabilize the entire membrane. Because remember, the fluid mosaic says you've got some side-to-side -side, uh, movement here. So how do you move things across that membrane? Well, there's two major categories of types of transport, passive transport and active transport. Passive transport, this does not require any energy to move things. And why is that? It's because you're moving down your concentration gradient. You are moving something from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. From a chemical standpoint, that's the way it wants to move. It's as though you're paddling uh, a canoe or a kayak down a stream that has a current. Or let's say you're wanting to go tubing. You're going to go with the current. You don't have to expend any energy. Just kind of avoid any rocks or trees or anything in the water. and Just let the current take you down. It's the same type thing. Substances want to move from high concentration to low concentration. It's the natural way they want to go. And so passive transport utilizes that. Active transport does require the use of energy. And the reason is because you're moving against the concentration gradient. You're going against the current. So when I talk about the concentration gradient, you're talking about whether it's an increase or a decrease in the density of whatever that chemical is that you're talking about. So we're first going to talk about passive transport. There are several different types of passive transport. Three most common ones are going to be diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion. Diffusion is simply where a particle moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. It wants to continue moving until it reaches equilibrium. Usually you're talking about, in biology, movement across a membrane. So you're trying to move from one side to another until you reach equal concentrations on both. Because you're going from high to low concentration the way it wants to go, remember no energy is required. So this is just showing in this example where you have your plasma membrane or cell membrane right here. You have all these blue particles on this side. Well, when it diffuses, it's just going to move across into the cytoplasm now until you reach equal concentration. That's all it is. You can uh, see this or do this at home if you want. If you take a beaker or a glass of water and then just put one drop of food coloring in it and then just let it sit. The food coloring, the dye, is all concentrated 
in that one drop that you added to the water. There's nothing in the water. It's all in that one drop. If you just let it sit, so this is where it gets tricky. Just try to be patient. Don't mix it. Don't stir it. Just let it sit and see what happens. You'll notice that the dye starts to diffuse away from that drop. It's going from the high concentration to the low concentration. Facilitated diffusion is very similar. There's still passive, so no energy is required. The difference between simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion is that with facilitated diffusion, you need some help to get across the membrane. Why? Because remember the interior of that membrane is hydrophobic. So if you have a substance that's hydrophilic, something that easily dissolves in water, you hit that plasma membrane and it doesn't like the middle of it. You're literally hitting a wall. So how are you going to move across the membrane? Yes, you want to go from high concentration to low concentration, but you don't like that hydrophobic middle. So what happens is you need some help. And that's where some of these transport proteins will come into play. They may provide, remember in the early sample, it looked like a little tunnel where I did the analogy of a straw. So it can pass through that tunnel. Maybe it's going to bind to something on one side. It's like a gate. And it's going to open it on the other side. Um, so it's just that you need some assistance to move across. This is the way a lot of your polar molecules, a lot of your ions will move across because they don't like that hydrophobic region. So here's an example, once again, a channel, or trans, which is a transport protein. It's allowing the substances to move across that membrane from high concentration to low concentration. It's just it can't go through the membrane, through those phospholipids. Why? Because it's hydrophobic. These substances are hydrophilic. They don't mix. Osmosis. It's the third type of the passive transport. So once again, no energy is required. Osmosis, specifically, we are looking at the movement of water. Now, you may have to look at what's dissolved in the water to figure out which way the water is going to go. But we are specifically looking at how water is going to be diffusing across that membrane. How is it going to move? One thing you have to keep in mind with water when you are talking about the movement of it, it's going to be dependent on what's dissolved in the water. That's going to play a huge role. And so just keep in mind that um, when we talk about equal concentration of water, it does not necessarily mean equal volume of water. So in this diagram, it visually, I think, helps you to see this. That in this beaker, the red is a membrane. So these little purple balls, you have obviously a lot more over here on the right-hand side of the membrane. You have equal volume, but you do not have equal concentration. If you allow osmosis to occur, so you are allowing the water not what's dissolved in it, you're allowing the water to reach equal concentration relative to what's dissolved in it, it's a different volume. When you are looking at the flow of water to determine which way direction is it going to diffuse, to try to equalize the concentration, water is always going to flow towards the higher solute concentration. It's going to flow towards the, remember the solute is what is dissolved in it. And so water is going to flow to where that higher concentration is because the more solute you have, the less water you have. So it's going to want to, water goes from high to low concentration. And so tonicity is looking at which way the water is flowing and what's going to ultimately happen to the cell. If the cell is in an environment 
or where the water concentration is not equal inside the cell versus outside the cell, you're going to see some movement of water. So which way is it going to go? Is the cell going to gain water? Is it going to lose water? There's three possible situations with tonicity. It is what we call isotonic, hypotonic, hypertonic. And what you are doing here is a comparison of the solution outside the cell and comparing it to the solution inside the cell. So it's a comparison between two things. In an isotonic solution, the concentration of the water outside in the solute, everything is equal outside the cell versus inside the cell. So the cell volume of water is going to remain the same. You're going to have flow back and forth, but it's going to be equal. This is a normal, situ healthy situation for animal cells. For humans, an isotonic solution is 0.89% sodium chloride. That is what saline solution is. So this is normal conditions. And why is this important in healthcare? Well, because if you have a patient who has whatever issue going on and they come into you let's say an emergency room and you need to deal with this patient you need to know what their underlying if they're dehydrated you need to know obviously what the underlying conditions are and if you need to start an IV you're probably going to start it with a saline solution. All of you have watched TV shows, the medical shows, and they're wheeling someone in. They start an IV in a saline solution. Why are they not starting an IV of water? Well, because saline solution is isotonic. The person already has an issue. Don't make it worse. Give them, if you're starting an IV, give them fluids that are equal to what the cell is so that you're not messing with the volume of the cells. A hypotonic solution. This is where I think hypo is less. Use your words and vocabulary to help you with this. Hypo means less or below. So the concentration of the solute, what's dissolved in the water, is less outside the cell than what's inside the cell. Now remember I said water is going to flow towards the higher solute. So if there's more solute inside the cell, that's the way the water is going to flow. So for animal cells, water is going to flow in and water is going to flow in. It's trying to reach equilibrium and that cell may end up bursting. Plants that are a little bit different. Hypertonic solution, hyper means more. So the solute concentration outside the cell is greater than what's inside the cell. Once again, water flows towards the higher solute concentration. So now the water is going to flow out and flow out until it can try to reach equilibrium. And if water keeps flowing out of that cell, well, the cell's losing the water. It's going to start to shrivel up. So this is shown with red blood cells. Once again, isotonic uh, is normal for animal cells. You have equal flow of water in and out. That is one reason also why, for all of those of you who wear contacts, your contacts, which you are going to place right next to your eye, which is <laughs> composed of cells. Do you want to be drawing water out of your eyes? Do you want to be adding water, more water in, having them swell up? No, you want to keep your eyes nice and healthy. So that is why you are supposed to be rinsing those contacts with saline solution and not tap water. Or as a roommate of mine in college used to do, is just take her contact and on her tongue, rinse it in her mouth, hopefully not swallow it, and then put it in her eye, which drove me nuts. Use your saline solution. Once again, hypertonic. Hyper means more outside the cell, so water's flowing out of the cell and it shrivels. This is not a healthy red blood cell. That's going to cause a lot of problems. Hypotonic, water's flowing into the cell and the cells are swelling to the point where they may burst. Once again, not healthy. Active transport. This is where you're going to be flowing against your concentration gradient. And so therefore that requires the input of energy. What kind of energy? It's going to be ATP. Why would you want to move something then 
against its concentration gradient, if that's not the way it naturally wants to flow, and it's going to cost you energy, why would you do that? Well, sometimes there are certain situations where in the body a cell has to maintain a concentration gradient. You don't want certain molecules to reach equilibrium inside the cell versus outside the cell. You need to have this difference. And the classic examples are with potassium and sodium. So real quick, those of you not familiar with chemistry, K is potassium, Na is sodium. Those you do not want to reach equilibrium. In order for your, your cells such as your neurons, to send a nerve impulse. You have to have this difference in the concentrations of sodium and potassium in order for you to generate then a muscle contraction. Same thing. You must have this concentration gradient, this difference inside the cell versus outside the cell. So under normal healthy conditions in animal cells, you have to have inside the cell a higher potassium and a lower sodium than what's outside the cell. You cannot have them reach equilibrium. If they reach equilibrium, that means you will never generate a nerve impulse. Nerve impulses are what will stimulate your muscles to contract. So therefore, that would mean you would never have muscle contraction and ultimately you're going to die. That's the bottom line. So if things are wanting to naturally flow from high to low concentration, and sometimes things can kind of leak through the cell membrane, so if you have high potassium inside the cell, and it's kind of wanting to leak out trying to reach equilibrium, but you can't have that, that means you need to pump potassium back inside the cell to keep it high. And you're doing the reverse with sodium. Sodium is higher outside the cell and it's trying to leak in, so you need to get it out. And that is what the sodium potassium pump will do, is it is going to move those ions against their concentration gradient, so that's active transport, it's going to cost you energy, but you have to do that to, to keep you alive is the bottom line. So how does this work? Well, what happens is the particular ion or solute is going to attach on the inside to a specific transport protein. And oftentimes with active transport, not only with sodium and potassium, but with several others, what we see is that you're moving two different molecules come in combination. So with the sodium potassium pump, and the bottom here is the cytoplasm, so this is inside the cell. And this is outside the cell, here is your cell or plasma membrane. So what ends up happening is, like I say, the concentration of sodium, which is yellow, this yellowish color here, you need to keep that high inside. So we need more of that on the bottom, less on top. But the reverse is true for the sodium, which is more of this reddish orange color. You want that higher on the top, lower on the bottom because the top is outside, the bottom is inside. What the sodium potassium pump is going to do, let's look at the sodium. It's high outside. There are certain areas where it's kind of leaking through the membrane. So here it is, trying to reach equilibrium. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. So it will bind the sodium on this uh, transport protein. So this, this is a protein here. It will bind three sodiums. Remember, whenever you bind things, it causes a shape change. So this, think of this as a gate. The gate's open on this side. Sodium comes in and binds when there's only three positions for it. So when it binds, boop, it closes the gate here, opens on the other side. It's like a hinge. Think of it. Flips open. Where does the sodium go? Here are the three sodiums that were bound. It costs you some energy. Remember, ATP, that's energy. So you move three of the sodiums out. When they are released, it causes a shape change, which now allows for two potassiums to bind. 
when the second potassium binds, it's like the bus is full, close the door, and it hinges and opens and releases the potassium on the inside. Now this protein is ready to pick up three more sodiums. And that's exactly what it's doing. It's pumping three sodiums out, two potassiums in. Three sodiums out, two potassium in. And that is the sodium potassium pump. And this is going continuously. And that is what is allowing. It's kind of like, you're going to sneak in through the back door. I'm going to push you out the front door. Oh, you're trying to go the other way? Well, we're going to switch it back. And you maintain that concentration gradient so that you can send electrical impulses, so you can have muscle contraction. Does it cost you energy? Yes, it does. But you're willing to do that because that's keeping you alive. We will see the sodium potassium pump again later on when we discuss muscle contraction and nerve impulses. Well, this is all great for moving small things, but how do you move large things? Exocytosis, once again, use your vocabulary to help you. Exo means out, cyto means cell, endo means in. So exocytosis, you're moving substances out of the cell. Endocytosis, you're moving into the cell, and there's three different types of that. Phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. For exocytosis, usually what you have is a vesicle that's been filled with material, and it Oftentimes, it's coming from the Golgi apparatus, which we'll talk in a bit about what that is. That vesicle is going to move towards the plasma membrane. It actually fuses with the plasma membrane, and when it fuses with it, it spills everything that was inside of it out of the cell. That vesicle then becomes part of the cell membrane. So here's your material. Vesicle moves up. Fuses with the membrane, spits everything out. What happens to the vesicle? As I said, it becomes part of the plasma membrane. So it's a, so you might be thinking, well, is the membrane continuing to get bigger and bigger and bigger? So that cell's getting bigger. Well, it's pretty well offset with endocytosis, where you're going to have the reverse happen. Phagocytosis is often referred to as cellular eating. It is when the cells engulfing solid material, and it's going to form a vacuole little vesicle, which is then, once it's inside the cell, will fuse with the lysosome that contains enzymes that will break down whatever it just engulfed. Penocytosis is very similar, however, it's engulfing fluid. Both phagocytosis and penocytosis are nonspecific, so they can take in whatever they want. So phagocytosis is solid, penocytosis is fluid. Receptor-mediated endocytosis is a very highly specific process of what it's going to take in. So now it's um, it's kind of like the cell is going to be it's very, very picky. It's not just going to, say, eat just any donut. It's only going to bind or take in a chocolate-covered donut that has white sprinkles on it. Everything else, forget very, very specific. How does it take things in or how does it work? It involves proteins that are embedded in the membrane that are what we call receptor proteins. So they will bind to the very specific substance that it takes in. If it's not that particular substance, it's just going to kind of bounce off. The membrane is going to kind of indent and form this pit and it forms a vesicle that has the material in it. So <laughs> Phagocytosis, as I said, you're going to engulf and take in a solid particle. Notice how when it forms and engulfs it, the vacuum wall was part of the cell membrane. So that's what I'm saying for exocytosis, you're going the reverse direction and the vesicle membrane becomes part of the, the cell membrane. Well, the reverse happens in Phagocytosis. So the cell membrane, the size of it, the cell pretty much remains constant after it's reached its full growth. Penocytosis, you're taking in fluid, and here's that receptor mediated. So you have these receptor proteins, these little green structures here. They're very specific for what they will bind to. Who cares about the little blue squares here? That's not what it's binding to. It will only bind to the, the stars. 
So when something binds to it, that triggers it to indent, and it will then engulf and take in the substance. Eukaryotic cells are a type of cell. When we look at cells, there's two main divisions of them, prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Prokaryotic cells are much simpler and much smaller, things like bacteria. Eukaryotic cells are more uh, complex than prokaryotes. They tend to be larger in size. From an evolutionary standpoint, they tend to be newer. Um, this would include things like plant cells, fungal cells, and animal cells. So our cells are eukaryotic cells. They do contain membrane-bound organelles in them. They also contain a nucleus, and inside the nucleus is where the DNA is. These are certain features that are found with eukaryotic cells, but not prokaryotes. So they have DNA, but it's in a nucleus. It gives an extra layer of protection. Those organelles that are found have very specific functions to help overall with the overall function of the cell. So as you can see in this eukaryotic cell here, you would have this membrane-bound nucleus. The DNA is inside here. And all of these other structures, that's what we're calling the organelles. And a lot of these are, have their own membranes. So that's why we say membrane-bound organelles. All of these will work together for the overall survival of the cell. But everybody has their own specific little job. In some ways, it's similar to your house that um, in my household, if you want to think of it, the nucleus, the DNA, that's the control center. So I'm going to be selfish and at least think that I'm the control center in my house. My kids have different uh, bedrooms where there's different environments, and it's going to be very different than, say, maybe the kitchen, which is different from the family room, because they have different purposes. Well, the organelles have different purposes, different functions. They may have a slightly different environment, say, inside the structure versus outside the structure that allows the cell to carry out a very particular function, trying to be more efficient. So we're going to look at some of these. Now, some of the organelles were broadly divided into certain divisions depending on what they do. There is a membrane system within the cell that's referred to as the endomembrane system. It's composed of the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, and the lysosomes. So the endoplasmic reticulum, which is abbreviated as the ER, it's this whole network of these tubes and sacs. It's continuous with the nuclear envelope. It does have an environment inside of it that is separated from the cytoplasm. There's two types of ER, or endoplasmic reticulum. There's the rough ER. The rough ER has ribosomes that are attached to the outer surface, which is why it's called rough. Mm -hmm. It's involved with the synthesis of more membranes. It's also involved with protein synthesis. And most of the proteins that are made on the ribosomes that are attached to the rough ER are going to be exported or secreted out of the cell. The smooth ER the surface of it is smooth because it does not have any ribosomes attached to it. One of the main functions is that it's involved with lipid synthesis. It helps to process toxins and drugs. And you'll find that sometimes in certain organs of the body, such as the liver, the different organelles may have specific specialized functions. So like in the liver, the smooth ER is definitely involved with helping to process toxins and drugs that it comes in contact. Muscles, the smooth ER is involved with storing calcium that has to be released in order for the muscle contraction to occur. And this is just showing if you were to look on a schematic drawing, here is the rough ER. Remember, it is continuous with the nuclear membrane. It extends out from it. But you can see the little ribosomes, the little bumps on it. Those are the ribosomes versus the smooth ER that has nothing attached on the surface of it. And then these are actually pictures from elect, taken from electron microscope. And you can see all the little ribosomes attached versus here where it's not. 
The ribosomes, this is the site of where protein synthesis actually occurs. There are two types of ribosomes, free and bound. The free ones, as the name implies, they're just floating freely around in the cytoplasm. Most of the proteins that are going to be produced here will be used within the cell. And as I mentioned a bit ago, the ribosomes that are bound, those are attached on the outside of the rough ER, um, and usually those proteins are going to be exported out of the cell. The Golgi apparatus, this is going to look like a bunch of flattened sacs that are stacked on top of each other. The sacs are not interconnected, and what happens is a vesicle is going to come in on one side, fuse with the sac, and then it slowly that sac kind of moves down until it gets to the bottom, and then it will be released. So what's going on here? Usually protein modification. Sticking a carbohydrate maybe on a, a protein, sticking a lipid on a protein. You're, you're adding little things to it. And when you look at it, this is what it looks like. So oftentimes you may make a protein here on the rough ER. It's in a vesicle. It kind of pinches off from the rough ER. The protein inside comes in, fuses with the Golgi apparatus, moves down. By the time it gets to the bottom, the modifications have been completed. It pinches off in another vesicle, which is going to now come, fuse with the plasma membrane, and basically spit it out. So I often describe the Golgi apparatus. It kind of, when you're looking at a picture, it kind of looks like a stack of pancakes where you've got your syrup dripping on and here it's dripping off. Why would the cell go through the process of making a protein here, making modifications just to spit it out? It's like you went to the work of making it. Why do you get rid of it? Maybe that is a protein that has to be sent elsewhere in the body for a some other purpose. Or maybe you have a very large compound that you cannot pass across the membrane. So you need to break it into smaller compounds. That often involves enzymes. Enzymes are a protein. So there's lots of various reasons where you, you make something in one spot and then you have to export it elsewhere. Lysosomes, this is a sac, it's got membranes on it. What's inside of it? Very highly digestive enzymes. This is your recycling center. It's going to break things down. It can break down food that you've taken in into smaller components where the cell can easily use it. It can be used to help recycle worn out parts of the cell if they've been damaged or just older and you need to break it down for the parts, if you will. In some cells that are for more protection for you, they will, the cell can engulf foreign substances like bacteria and then the lysosomes will fuse with it and break down the bacteria. So you take something in to a vesicle, whether it's food, whether it's bacteria, the lysosome, it's going to come fused with it, dumping in those highly digestive enzymes, which will then break down. And the cell is great at recycling. It will use whatever of these little smaller bits that it can use, whether it's amino acids or um, sugars, whatever it is it can use in any waste products, then it will get rid of. The mitochondria, this is your powerhouse for the cell. This is where cellular respiration occurs, which is a process of producing ATP, which is energy. It's a way of converting chemical energy from your food that you took in into chemical energy of ATP. It does contain a double membrane. So there's a space between the inner membrane and the outer membrane. That's the inner membrane space. And then the mitochondrial matrix, that is the space inside the inner membrane, so the most interior portion. And in here in this mitochondrial matrix area, there are some ribosomes, there are some proteins, and there's some mitochondrial DNA that is there. That inner membrane has a lot of folds. Uh, or what we often call invaginations. And what this is, this increases the surface area 
and these folds are called the cristae. This is where the actual uh, ATP synthesis is going to take place. So you have your outer membrane, you have this little inner membrane space. Inside that inner membrane, this is your uh, matrix area, the cristae are all these folds. Whenever you see imaginations like this, all this interior folding, notice how it's really increasing the surface area versus just being smooth like this. You have greatly increased the surface area in here. That is a clue to you that something important is going on here that you want to increase the surface area. And indeed it is. That, like I said, that's where ATP synthesis is occurring. Proxosomes, these are vesicles that um, contain enzymes to be able to break down hydrogen peroxide. They can also break down fatty acids. In some cells, they will help with breaking down alcohol and other toxic type of compounds. The cytoskeleton is a whole network of fibers or protein fibers that will extend throughout the cell. Their function is to help uh, provide structural support. They are involved with transport. They are involved with cell reproduction. They're involved with cell motility. So like when you have a vesicle that goes off the endoplasm, rough endoplasmic reticulum and it's got to go to the Golgi apparatus, how does it know to get there? Oftentimes it follows along the cytoskeleton, along some of these protein fibers. It's like it's, it's moving in a track to get there. Uh, sometimes I describe it if you're a very visual person. It's almost like if, if you've watched the Disney movie uh, Monsters Inc., where they have all the doors on all the different tracks. It's kind of like that. You, you've got all these tracks for things to move inside the cell. That's part of the cytoskeleton. There's three main types of fibers. The microtubules are the thickest, they're very uh, hollow, straight tubes. They can be put together, taken apart, put together as needed. They help to provide rigidity to the um, the cell. And like I say, it does provide, uh, these are some of the tracks that things can move on. The microfilaments are the actin filaments. These are the thinnest. Uh, these can also be assembled and disassembled as needed. And then the intermediate filaments, um, these are the most permanent of the three. And these are also going to help anchor the organelles in place, help reinforce the shape. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this is just showing um, these three different types of the filaments that make up the cytoskeleton. They, the cytoskeleton, some of these filaments are involved with some uh, structures that you may see extending out on the exterior portion of the cell. Not on all cells, but on some. Uh, you don't have to worry about how in detail how the structure works. But two of these examples I mentioned are the cilia. These are very short and numerous. Um, on the free surface of a cell, we see these in like the along the trachea of the respiratory system where the, the cilia will all move in unison to help move things. Um, when cilia are present on a cell, the cell is stationary. It's not moving. So it stays still, but when the cilia are all moving, think of like seaweed, all moving in fashion. So the cell is still, the cilia, which is on the free surface, is moving. And what is that doing? It's moving fluid and substances across that free surface of the cell. So the cell stays still, but you've got things moving. It could be nutrients that are moving. It could be like in the respiratory tract where you're moving phlegm. You're trying to keep debris from getting into your lungs and clear that out. Just FYI. Someone who is a smoker, over long-term smoking, what happens is the cilia cannot move as freely anymore, which makes it more difficult to move the phlegm and all that debris out and prevent it from getting in the lungs. So the only way that you have to get it out is to cough. And that's why an individual who has smoked for a long period of time 
develops that classic smoker's cough because the cilia, they're not as flexible anymore. They're not moving as well. Now, if you stop smoking over time, then that can be restored. The flagella, usually now you only have one or two of those per cell. And what happens is now the flagella, instead of the cell being still a moving fluid across it, now the flagella is going to move the cell through the medium. And we, in humans, where we see the flagella is on the sperm cell. The nucleus is the control center of the cell. This is where the DNA is. It is surrounded by a nuclear envelope, which is also a double membrane. It does have pores in it that allows for communication. If the nucleus is the control center, it has to know what's going on in the rest of the cell. It has to know what's going on outside the cell to know how to respond. So these nuclear pores do allow for some uh, flow of materials in and out of the nucleus. It is going to be controlled. So this is showing, <coughs> excuse me, so this is your nucleus. Here is your nuclear membrane with the pores that's allowing things to flow in and out in a controlled fashion. Here's your uh, rough ER with the ribosomes attached. Inside the nucleus, we do have the nucleolus. We'll see that in just a moment. That's where your ribosomal RNA is going to be made that's needed to make the ribosomes, which is needed to make protein. Chromatin, just so you're aware, I know this can be rather annoying. Chromatin is your DNA. We like to give things multiple names and then not always tell you what the multiple names are. So the chromatin, this is the DNA. So that nucleolus that I just pointed out to you, as you see, it is inside the nucleolus. So you're making your ribosomal RNA. Um, it's going to, ribosomal RNA will bind to proteins to form the ribosome. So you have to first make the ribosomal RNA and then move it outside the cell. Just so you know, if you look at, say, a cheek cell, it's probably one of the most common cells to look at under a microscope. Um, you have to stain a cell in order to see it because they're colorless. So when you stain a cell, with a regular light microscope, let's say magnified 400 times for telemagnification, you will be able to see the nucleus. Sometimes, depending on how well it takes up the stain, sometimes you can see the nucleolus. It will just look like a darker circle within the nucleus. Now the DNA. The DNA is going to be found in that nucleus. DNA is in length for humans in each cell. It is linear, eukaryotes, circular and prokaryotes, but in eukaryotes in our cells, it is linear. Um, if you were to stretch it out, it's about um, two meters, which is the equivalent of almost about six feet. So, how do you fit this DNA in? It's, it's worse than, say, Christmas time trying to get packages all stuffed in a box. How are you going to get it all to fit? So, the DNA is these long strands twisted up into double helix. And then what happens, there are certain proteins. Histones are proteins. There's usually eight of them in a group. And what happens is the DNA is going to tightly wrap around that. And then that's what we call a nucleosome. And then all those are going to be tightly coiled up and condensed until you finally have the chromatin. Now, technically speaking, the terminology that we use, and this is all very tightly coiled up, we call the DNA chromatin. What chromatin is telling me is that you have the DNA already wrapped around these histones forming the structure and it's all tightly coiled up. That is the form the DNA usually is going to be in. When it is going through replication, which we'll see in a bit, uh, then it goes into the chromosome form, which is a little bit more relaxed form.
So this DNA, which is in the nucleus, DNA contains all of the genetic information. In this chapter remaining yet, we're still going to talk about how the cell goes through cell division. Well, if you're going to go from one cell to two cells, you're going to make a new one. You need to make copies of everything to fit in that cell, right? So before you can go through cell division, you're going to have to make a copy of that DNA so each new cell has its own copy of DNA. That's what we call DNA replication. Now, personally, I don't care if you call it DNA replication, DNA duplication, DNA synthesis. The bottom line is DNA is a strand. You're going to have to have double that amount. So you have a double helix. You got to make a copy of it. How are we going to do this? You have that. Remember, DNA is a double strand together that's twisted in that double helix. So you've got those parental DNA strands. The parental ones are the original ones. They're going to have to separate. We're going to use them as a template to make a copy of it. The copy is going to be what we call the daughter strand, the new one. How are we going to do that? It's going to be dependent on what we call the base pairing. So remember, here is our structure of the DNA, that double helix. So we have to untwist this. Remember, these little bars, up, colored bars here, those are your nitrogenous bases. They're held, the two strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. Adenine and thymine always, always will pair together. So you have thymine on one strand, it will always pair with the adenine on the other strand. It's going to be held together by hydrogen bonds. Guanine is always going to be paired with cytosine. That is what complementary base pairing rule states. Now, a and T, because remember we use the letter abbreviations. A and T always bind together with two hydrogen bonds. G and C always bind together with three hydrogen bonds. How do you remember this? There's different ways of remembering it. Years ago I had a former student who came up with a way it surprised me because she asked me a question about it, started asking me about how many apples were in the tree, and I had no clue what she was talking about. I was like, I don't have an apple tree. I don't know what you're talking about. And finally she said the way she remembered it was that there were two apples in a tree, A-T, apple tree. And then I said, oh, I can hardly wait to hear what you have to say about GC. And she goes, well, everyone would love to have a three- car garage. I'm just mentioning this as use whatever method it is that helps you to remember because this is going to come back in a moment. DNA replication is described as being semi-conservative and what this means is that when the DNA temp uh, strands those original parental strands will separate and be used as a template to make the new ones. The two original ones will not go back together and the two brand new ones end up together. That's not what happens. Semi-conservative means that at the end what you will end up with is one parental strand and one new daughter strand. So you, the gray is the original DNA strands. So this has got to separate. So each one, each of these parental strands will be used as a template to make the new daughter strand. So you end up with one old and one new. That's all semi-conservative. Origin of replication. These are special sites on the DNA where you're going to start the whole process of replication. Protein is going to attach to the DNA there and start the process. What you have to do first is you have to, un before you can even separate the strands, remember they're twisted in that helix. So first thing you have to do is untwist the helix. Relieve some of that stressor. So you've got to untwist the helix. This is going to start at these origin of replication sites. And then replication is going to, usually there's several origin of replications. So replication is going to occur in both directions at the sites. 
So once you have separated, untwisted the helix, you separate the strands, you're holding the strands apart now so they can be used as a template. An enzyme comes in that's known as DNA polymerase. This enzyme is going to add nucleotides forming that new strand of DNA. It can only work in one direction. And so the DNA strands when we talk about a five prime and three prime, prime direction, this is referring to the orientation of the sugar, essentially. <coughs> we number the carbons on the sugar, and that's what it's referring to. You don't have to know that for this class, but, but just so you know that five prime and three prime, it's the numbering of the carbons on the sugar. And so with the DNA being double-stranded, essentially the strands are going to what we call anti-parallel. They're going in different directions. Well, the DNA polymerase can only read in one direction. So what this results in is that one daughter strand is going to be made as a one long continuous strand. The other strand is going to be made in pieces that have to be then later connected together. So here's your, your DNA strand. Double helix. Right here is uh, your origin site would have been off screen, but right here is where you are. Think that it's like you're unzipping. So this is what we call the replication fork because it's where it's splitting right now. You are moving in the right to left direction in terms of how you're unzipping. So you're separating those. Helicase is just an enzyme that's helping to untwist the DNA, separate them. And so you're using the original parental strands as a template. This yellow structure here is your DNA polymerase that is coming along and it's reading, using this as a template and adding in, making a new strand. This is being made continuously here. Now, down here on this strand, this is where you're having to make it in pieces. Why? Because the DNA polymerase can only read one direction, so it's reading from left to right here, going in this direction, as you can see. So it's going to make a, it's got to read through all of this, putting in the bases one at a time, just like you do up here, but it's reading in this direction. But you're unzipping in the opposite way. So when it's going to read down here, when it hits the stopping point, it's got to come back over here, then it's going to read this section, and then it's going to have to connect those pieces together. <coughs> the process that we're going to look at several different things besides DNA replication. So the process that we're going to have to move through ultimately to make protein is going to be a couple steps. So you've just made your DNA uh, copy. So you did DNA replication. That has to occur prior to cell division so that you end up with two sets of the DNA, so each new cell will get its own DNA. Now, throughout the life cycle of the cell, it often needs proteins. We've already talked about all the different functions of proteins, so that at any particular time, you have hundreds of chemical reactions that are going on, you've got lots of proteins that are needed, and so you've got to make those. Well, how do you know how to make the protein? Well, that information is going to come from the RNA. Well, where does the RNA get it? It gets it from the DNA. DNA is going to be used as a template to make RNA. And that process is called transcription. You're simply copying the information from one source to another. RNA is then going to be used as a template to make proteins in the process of called translation. DNA and RNA, as you know, are both nucleic acids. So they pretty much speak the same language. They're monomers of the nucleotides. Proteins are made up of amino acids. So it's like they speak a different language. And this is where you use your words once again. Transcription, you're just copying something. Translation, you're having to convert from one language to another. 
And so it's as though in the DNA you are taking that information and saying, Hi, how are you? You copy it here for the RNA. You copied it. Hi, how are you? But now to make the protein, you have to switch because it speaks a different language. So now you're going to have to go, Oh, bonjour, comment allez-vous? You, you've got to have a process here, a way of, of translating from one language to another for the cell. So the genetic code just means a set of rules that we have found that exist that allows for this translation from RNA, um, the base sequence in the RNA to the amino acids and proteins. This genetic code is universal. It's the same whether you are talking about human cells or bacterial cells or plant cells. We have found that it is the same. And so what does this mean? Well, when you look at the DNA, you have those nitrogenous bases, your A, T, C, and Gs. They have very, it's very specific what that base sequence is. Well, that's great. So your DNA and your RNA are speaking with bases, but the protein speaks in amino acids. So how do you convert that? Every three bases is known as a codon. And this is what we refer to as a triplet code because a codon has three bases. One codon essentially is equal to one amino acid. So in other words, every three bases codes for one amino acid. So what's going to happen here with what we have up here is our DNA. We have our base sequence. Through the process of transcription, you're going to make RNA, which is also a base sequence. And then through the process of translation, we're going to make our protein, which is now a sequence of amino acids. Remember when you're either for DNA replication when you're copying it, and then also when you're carrying out transcription and making your RNA, complementary base pairing rule, I alluded to this earlier, states that A and T always bind together and G and C always binds together. So if I gave you just one strand of DNA, an individual would automatically know what the other base sequence for the complementary strand would be. You would also know what the base sequence on the RNA would be. Now remember, G and C always bind together, A and T always binds together. However, remember it's this bottom line. You're using the top DNA strand as a, um, the template for making the RNA. So when you see a T, it would put an A in. But remember, T is not found in RNA. So when you see an A, it would put a U instead. So if I gave you one strand of DNA, you or anyone else should be able to, number one, come up with a complementary base sequence of DNA. You should also be able to come up with the base sequence for the RNA. And someone who studies this from this base sequence of RNA, they could determine what the amino acid sequence would be for the protein. Not that I'm going to ask you that, I'm just saying. So in transcription, we're going to use that DNA as a template. <coughs> we're only going to use one strand of the DNA. And we're going to make RNA, specifically a type called messenger RNA. Just so you know that in eukaryotes, this is going to occur in the nucleus, because that's where the DNA is. Prokaryotic cells, such as bacteria, it's a little bit different. It's going to occur in the cytoplasm, because they don't have a nucleus. <coughs> So what happens with transcription? We have a couple areas. The promoter, this is the start site. This is an area on the DNA where we have a different enzyme. It's called RNA polymerase. It is very similar to DNA polymerase, but it's different because you're making RNA. It is the RNA polymerase is going to bind to this start site, which is known as the promoter. What's the purpose of that? Well, it puts the RNA polymerase in the proper orientation. And it basically it's like, start here, and I'm going to tell you now, this is a strand, because remember you only read one strand, so this helps to orient you in the proper direction, which way to read and which strand to read. That RNA polymerase is going to put in the correct complementary base 
using DNA as a template, using those base pairing rules that I just mentioned to you that A and T is going to look at that versus the A and U and then the G and C. So with your steps for transcription, prokaryotes as well as eukaryotes, it's going to be initiation, elongation, and termination. So here is your um, DNA. Not the whole thing opens up because when you're going to be making a protein, you have a gene for a protein that may just be on a certain area of the DNA. On a long strand of DNA, you have literally thousands of genes. So you don't need to open up the whole thing. You just need to open up the point that you're looking at. So <clears throat> you would open, you're using this template. And notice how it's putting in the complementary base pairing. The green here is your new messenger RNA or mRNA. Your RNA polymerase, it bound initially to the promoter site, it's reading along, it will continue until it reaches a stop area, and then it will terminate. Now there are some modifications that have to be made after the mRNA has been made. After. So once the, the mRNA, you reach a, the initiation is where you bind to the promoter site, elongation, you're adding on one base at a time, termination, you reach a stop point, it tells you to stop. That's all you need. The mRNA is made, it detaches from the DRN, the DNA, the DNA coils back up. DNA does not like to be separated. It's very unstable when it's separated. It's very vulnerable to being broken down. So as soon as it's done, it's going to twist back into that double helix. Get those two strands together, protect it. So now you made the mRNA, single strand. You're still in the nucleus, but you have to do some modifications. First thing you're going to do is add on a cap and a tail. Cap is you're going to add one guanine on one side. The tail you're going to add anywhere from 50 to 250 adenines on the other end. Why do you do this? Well, number one, it's going to help you to move the mRNA out of the nucleus through those nuclear pores out into the cytoplasm. It's going to help protect it from enzymes once it's out in the uh, cytoplasm. And ultimately, it's also going to help the ribosomes bond to that mRNA for protein synthesis to occur. But we're not done yet. DNA, what we have found in eukaryotic cells, prokaryotics like bacteria, it's a little bit different. They tend to keep things short, sweet, and simple. DNA, um, there's some extra material in those strands that you don't always need. And sometimes there's areas where, depending on what protein you need, you may cut certain portions out. And so you have to make those modifications. And this is what we call RNA splicing. Introns are the non-coding areas. Those are the areas you're going to cut out. And the exons are the areas that you're going to keep. Personally, I've always thought those terms are backwards, but that's just the way I think about it. So the introns, you're going to have to remove it. You keep the exons, but you're going to have to join those now together. That's the RNA splicing. Once you've done that, then the mRNA can leave the nucleus. So in this diagram here, at the very top, here is your mRNA that you made um, by transcription. You put the cap and the tail on it. So there's an area here that you don't need, correct? This, this big area here, and there's a big area over here. And so what are you going to do? You need to cut these green areas out. So you cut it out, and then you splice the remaining pieces together to keep that. What happens to that intron? It's going to be broken down. You can reuse all those bases, etc. And then this spliced RNA is now what is the mature mRNA that can now leave the nucleus. Why would you put in extra stuff? Well, because the DNA for eukaryotic cells, maybe you need, let's say, protein A. Okay, what you need for protein A is the segments on exon 1, exon 2, and exon 3. 
But maybe if you need protein B, you need the material on intron, this first intron, exon 2, and exon 3. And protein C, you need exon 1, intron, intron. So in this one stretch, you can come up with a lot of different combinations for a lot of different proteins and save them space that way. So there is an advantage to having it. So the mRNA contains a sequence of bases, but the protein, as I said, speaks a different language. Protein is a sequence sequence of amino acids. So now you have to do your conversion. You have to do your translation and convert from bases to amino acids. Where does translation occur? This protein synthesis. You're going to use the mRNA that you just made as a template to make the protein. This is going to occur at the ribosomes. It involves your mRNA, your tRNA, which is transfer RNA, and your ribosomal RNA that we saw that was made in the nucleus. So those ribosomes, which is the site of where the protein synthesis occurs, it actually has two subunits that have to come together. The size of those subunits, just FYI, in eukaryotes, they're slightly larger than that from the prokaryotic cells. The subunits are composed of both proteins and ribosomal RNA. And the whole purpose of the ribosomes is that it is going to bring two of your transfer tRNAs, your, your transfer RNAs, close enough together to form a peptide bond. Remember, a peptide bond is a bond between two amino acids. So what you're going to do, transfer RNAs, they go out and they bind to an amino acid. So on the end of them, they have an amino acid. So if you bring two of those together, each of them having an amino acid, you're bringing them close enough to form this peptide bond between those two amino acids. And that's what you want to do because you're wanting to make a protein, which is a sequence of amino acids. You have to form those peptide bonds to get that chain of amino acids. How do you know what order to put the amino acids in? That's the information that you just put on the ribosome, on the, um, the messenger RNA. So this ultimately is what you are going to do. This blue is the ribosome. You have two subunits, a small one and a large one. They're usually separated unless they are making a protein. This little purple strand in here, here's your messenger RNA. That contains the information from the DNA. That contains the information of what order to put the amino acids in. Here's your tRNA that has an amino acid stuck on it, and you're going to be making this chain, adding one amino acid at a time, which is a protein. So the ribosomes are going to bring all the players you need the the mRNA that has the code, that has the message. You need to bring in the tRNA. Why? Because that has the amino acids. You need to bring two of those in to form the peptide bonds. So the ribosome is providing a location and bringing everyone in close enough together to do this properly. So that tRNA it's going to pick up an amino acid. It's very specific. There are over, there are 20 amino acids. It can only pick up one. It's very specific. If it picks up the amino acid glycine, that is the only one it will pick up. It is able to recognize a codon, which is a three-base sequence, on the mRNA. So just like most RNAs, it's going to be single-stranded. It's folded up into a three-dimensional shape. At one end of it, it has what's known as an anti-codon region. This is what recognizes the codon on the mRNA. Opposite of that is an amino acid binding site where it will attach the amino acid to it. And then, like I said, it's very specific. So your steps of translation, you have initiation, elongation, which itself is subdivided into codon recognition, peptide bond formation, translocation, and then you have termination. So here we go in a nutshell. For initiation, you have your mRNA. 
which is this long kind of orange colored strand here. It is going to bind to the smaller subunit of the ribosome, it's getting it in the proper placement. Then your larger ribosome is going to come in. Your first tRNA is going to come in. Now notice, here's your codon on your mRNA. Remember, every three bases is a codon. On the tRNA, you have your anticodon region. This is complementary basis to here. If the codon and the anticodon do not complement exactly, this, the tRNA is just going to bounce off. It's not going to bind, but it is complementary, so it binds. That large subunit comes in, places that tRNA in the proper, there's a certain spot that it fits in, so it's going to put it in the proper orientation. This now allows for the second tRNA to come into its site. Once again, the anticodon binds to the codon region, and they're complementary. This is bringing these two amino acids that are sticking off the other end close enough together to form a peptide bond. When they form a peptide bond, remember, whenever you form a bond, you get a shape change. That shape change is going to kick this first tRNA out. It breaks the bond with its amino acid, and sorry, you're out of here. Where does it go? It goes out in the cytoplasm to pick up another amino acid. Everything shifts over, and now your next tRNA comes in. Anticodon, codon, if they're complementary, it binds. Once again, it's bringing these two tRNAs close enough together so you can form the peptide bond between the amino acids on the other end. So initiation is the binding of the first tRNA, the ribosomal subunits coming together with the mRNA. Everyone's coming into position. After that, you're just going to move one codon at a time, and that's elongation. <coughs> Until you reach a stop codon, and then everything separates. So in the nucleus, you have your DNA. Transcription is the process of using DNA as a template to make your messenger or your mRNA, which is single-stranded. You're going to have to do your modifications, adding the cap and the tail, do your RNA splicing when it's mature, when it's complete. It has to now move out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm because that's where the ribosomes are, and that is where translation will occur, which is protein synthesis. All of this is driven by what are the needs of the cell right now. It may be very different in 10 minutes. It may be very different than what it was 20 minutes ago. It's what are the needs right now. And the cell can very quickly adapt and change to a changing environment, therefore changing needs. To be very efficient, oftentimes a single mRNA may have multiple ribosomes attached to it so that you can have a lot of protein production at one time. So with the cell life cycle, it is divided into two main phases, interphase and the mitotic phase. Interphase is where the cell is going to spend most of its time. This is when the cell, you have a brand new cell. This is when it's actively growing. You are carrying out all kinds of chemical reactions. You're making lots of proteins like we just saw the processes for a translation. That is all occurring. You have some of the organelles may be replicating. At a certain point in interphase, you will have DNA replication occur. The mitotic phase is only a very small portion of the overall life cycle of the cell, and that is when cell division is going to occur. Interphase, as I said, is where most of the time will be spent. It's a high metabolic activity time. It is divided or subdivided into three parts, the G1, the S, and the G2. The G1 is the first gap. This is where a brand new cell starts in the G1. It's growing actively. It's metabolic, very actively. So you're making proteins. <coughs> Initially, you're growing in size. Um, you're responding to the environment, etc. The S phase, the most important thing that occurs here is DNA replication. You know you're going to be going through cell division. So to prepare for it, you have to replicate that DNA ahead of time. 
After you've done that, then you will move to the G2, which is the second gap. Phase. This is where you're going to continue with cell growth, continue those chemical reactions, and you're going to be preparing for cell division ultimately. So you also need to be replicating all of the organelles. You need to replicate the Golgi apparatus and the mitochondria so that each of the brand new cells will have an appropriate amount of those organelles. So if you have a brand new cell, <coughs> as you can see here, it's going to move around through the G1, through the S, through the G2, and the M little slice of the pie right here, that's the mitotic phase. So you can see proportionally very little time is spent in that portion. As I said earlier, we use different terminology for DNA. It's all DNA. The chromatin is the term that we use to describe DNA um, when it is wrapped around those histones, those proteins. And even though they're tightly coiled up to a certain extent, um, compared to another stage, they're considered as long. Chromosome is still DNA, but this is where now it, it tightly uh, condenses, even more so than what it was before. And under a light microscope, you can actually see it. This is what will happen. You technically see the chromosome form during the mitotic phase. When a cell goes through cell the actual cell division and nuclear division um, of mitosis and meiosis, you can see this. Sister chromatids refers to when you have the identical DNA, you've made a copy of it, you've replicated, but the two are still a, attached in the middle. So what happens is, <coughs> excuse me, you have um, your chromosome. It's tightly chrome. So you have one here. And it made a copy during DNA replication, but there's a little area where it is still attached. It's not quite finished. It's still attached. That area where it's still attached is referred to as the centromere. In the middle of that centromere where it's still attached is a protein called the kinetochore. Now, this is a copy of this strand, so they are referred to as sister chromatids. Some people refer to them as like they're, they're twins. The mitotic phase is when you have cell division occurring. Technically, it's divided into two parts, mitosis, which is when those chromosomes are going to divide, and then cytokinesis is when the cytoplasm divides. Mitosis is divided into four stages. Some books you may see this five. Uh, the four stages are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Prophase, there are several events that occur here. Some people will actually divide prophase into prophase and prometaphase. But we'll just kind of group them together. Oftentimes people will get confused and try to come up with ways of remembering how do I keep these different stages in the proper order. Some people just learn it as PMAT. There's various stages. One way I learned years ago that it seems that college students often will remember is pass me another tequila. Whatever helps you to remember it. So what happens in these stages? Well, prophase, what's going to happen here? The chromatin, remember, that's the DNA. It was loosely kind of strung out. It's going to very tightly coil up into that chromosome form. And you definitely see the two sister chromatids. Why? Because DNA replication has already occurred. The other events that occur is that the nucleolus is going to disappear. Your nuclear membrane is going to disintegrate and disappear. The centrosomes, which contain the centrioles, those start to move away from each other. They're going to move to opposite ends of the, the cell. And from them, you start to see the spindle fibers being formed. 
the spindle fiber, one end is attached to the centriole, the other end is ultimately going to attach to that kinetochore, that, that protein that I showed you that was on the, the centromere. It's on the middle there where the two sister chromatids are still attached. Metaphase is going to be the next stage where the centrioles are now on opposite poles and the chromosomes are lined up right down the middle. It's what we call the equatorial plate. They're lined up right down the middle. Visually it's very easy to see. There's no doubt about it. Anaphase, think apart. Now the sister chromatids are going to finish separating and they're going to be start to be pulled towards opposite ends. Why? Because they're attached, remember, to the spindle fibers. Well, the other end of the spindle fibers attach to the centriole. And when the spindle fibers, they start contracting. And so it's going to be pulling the sister chromatids to opposite poles. Telophase essentially is the reverse of prophase. What's going to happen here is that that nuclear envelope is going to reappear. Your nucleolus starts to reappear. Those chromosomes that were tightly condensed up, which you could see under a light microscope, they're going to now start to relax and uncoil a bit. Your spindle fibers are going to disappear. So I say it's a reverse of prophase. Cytokinesis, which is technically a separate event. Remember, it is uh, the cytoplasmic division. However, it is timed so that it will end at the same time as telophase is, is ending. All of this is very tightly regulated and controlled. So it's going to divide that cytoplasm. So when cytokinesis is finished, what happens is you will end up with two daughter cells. They are genetically identical to each other, and they are genetically identical to that original parent cell. And in this table, which I know looks huge with all the information, but it does give once again just another summary of what is going on in each of these stages. As I said, some books do combine uh, prophase and prometaphase together. That's the way I presented it initially. And some people separate out some of the events as two separate prophase versus prometaphase. <coughs> I will accept either way. You end up ultimately at the end with two new daughter cells. So down here on the bottom you can actually see uh, pictures where they've used a dye and you can actually see uh, the events of mitosis occurring. Notice right here the green are the spindle fibers. And right here, this light blue, those are the chromosomes. So you can see them lined up right down the middle, and now they're being pulled apart. And you have the reformation of the nucleus. The timing of this must be controlled very carefully. Uh, most cells are only going to divide when they receive a stimulus for it because you don't want them just randomly dividing. Uh, some cells never divide. After birth, what you have, that's it. Growth factors are proteins that are secreted by cells that will stimulate other cells to divide. So oftentimes, number one, it's going to be things like when you are a child growing the growth hormones do act as a stimulus for cells to carry out mitosis. There are other times like when you have an injury, you have a cut, that there will be a stimulus there, these proteins that will stimulate the cells that are near the injured site to go through mitosis, go through that cell division to assist with the repair and maintenance of a damaged site. So there are very strict uh, regulatory control mechanisms throughout the life cycle of the cell. So once again, you have a brand new cell. It enters into that G1. It's growing in size. There is a checkpoint here. If something is picked up and is determined that there's something abnormal going on, that cell will not be allowed to continue into the S phase, which remember is when your DNA replication occurs. Everything passes, everything's okay. That cell is allowed to continue 
through the S phase where you have the DNA replication occur, and then it goes into the G2 uh, substage. Towards the end of G2, there's a very critical checkpoint here that if anything abnormal is picked up, that cell will not be allowed to go into the mitotic phase. If there's a problem with the cell, you don't want it to go through cell division, and now instead of having one abnormal cell, now you have two. And so there's a, uh, this is a very critical checkpoint right here, just prior to the mitotic phase. In mitosis, there is, uh, once again, also another checkpoint with the formation of the two daughter cells. So it is very tightly regulated. Do mistakes sometimes get through? Yes, they do. But if you consider the number of cells and how rapidly they're going, it's, it's very, very uh, efficient.